So hello and welcome to another Focus on the Future online tutorial using the Integrated Genome Browser. I'm Nolan Fries and I will once again be your guide for today. So for this Focus on the Future, I'd like to go through some exciting new features the IGV team has added in the just released IGV version 8.2. I've included several new features that have been heavily requested as well as continuing to improve and update the overall look and feel of IGBE. Now joining me today is our senior software developer, David Norris, who's actually sitting right next to me. Hi everyone. As well as the IGBE team leader, Dr. Anne Lorraine, who's in the other room. So they're both here to answer any and all questions you might have about IGBE. Feel free to stop me during the talk, or you need me to back up and repeat something. So to start off, if you're running an older version of IGBE, you'll notice that in the bottom right hand corner, there's a notification that states an update is available. Now if you click on this, you'll get this notification where you can go to the download page and get the newest version of Igby. So once you have that new version of Igby, um, the first thing you might notice is that we've added several new genomes. Some notables include the tomato genome, as well as the most recent version of the fly genome. And both these were just updated this year. So looking at the toolbar, we've also updated several of the icons to make it even more intuitive to navigate through Igby. For instance, we've changed the uh, snapshot icon to a camera, the preferences icon to a gear, and now by default, we've included this home icon to bring you back to the home screen. And keep in mind that if you need, need or want to change those icons around, you can go to preferences, toolbar, and you can include or uh, exclude any buttons you want, as well as potentially change their keystroke. So to demonstrate some new features, let's say that we've just carried out an RNA-seq experiment in tomato, and we want to look at the results for a specific gene of interest. So in order to do this, let's go ahead and go into a, our tomato genome. I'm just gonna kind of clean this up a little bit and add in our data. Let's go to our gene of interest. And load our data and load our sequence. Okay, so I've loaded everything in and gone to my gene of interest. Now, if I'm interested in quickly finding out some information about my favorite gene of interest, I can now hover my cursor over that gene. So this is our new tooltip, and it is now enabled by default. So the tooltip provides a wealth of information about the gene itself, such as the length, strand, and a short description about the potential known functions of that gene. So if you hover over a specific uh, feature of that gene, you'll get information that's specific to that feature. So in this case, I'm hovering over the exon, and you can see that the length is 247, versus the full gene itself, which is about 8,000 base pairs. So similarly, you can also hover over things like your reads and get all kinds of information, such as each read's length, its average quality, and the residues themselves. So if you want to turn off those tooltips, or in case you want to turn off those tooltips, just come up here to the top, and you can disable them. So now you see I get nothing but they're quite helpful to have on. Now you can also get more information about the gene or reads that you're looking at by right-clicking on them. There we go, let's go here. So we've revamped this menu to make it even easier to find information. So clicking on Google will search Google for that gene of interest. You can also uh, right-click and get info to give you a very similar list of information as to the tooltips themselves. And then you can also look at the genomic sequence, or if you're looking at a read, you can also look at its specific read sequence. Okay. So another intuitive and helpful new addition is the ability to right-click on white space within a track. So whereas before, in order to get this, this right-click menu, you had to click on this track um, label here. Now you can click anywhere within the white space to get that same track label. 
So keep in mind, this is specific to wherever you're clicking on that track. So if I click here, I'm going to get the information that is specific to this track. Whereas if I click up here, I should get the information specific to this track. Now, one of the things you might have noticed is that we've added a new button under this right-click menu, and that is the Show as Pair. This is a heavily requested feature that we're really glad to be able to implement. And clicking on the Show as Pair button does a number of things. So you'll notice that the reads are now colored by strand, so purple and blue here. And both strands will be placed in the same track. So assuming you already have it done so, both the negative and positive strands will be placed uh, in one track. And the paired reads will be in the same row connected by a thin line. So if I zoom in here, you can see that these paired reads are now connected likewise. Now if they're split by a junction, in this case, they'll have kind of this barbed wire appearance. So overlapping mated reads will appear next to each other, and they should have the same name, for instance, these two. And unpaired reads will have no black line connecting them to another read, and will have an arrowed appearance by default. So something like this, or this. Okay. Now if a paired end read is not alternatively colored, but it is connected to uh, it's two paired ends. This could indicate a structural change at that location. So this is where you could see an instance of an inversion showing up within the genome. And similarly, if you have your paired end data and you expect there to be a difference or a, a size uh, between those two paired ends, um, you know, let's say 100, 200 base pairs, and you see an instance where you have paired ends that are much, much further away than that, uh, or much closer, you could be looking at something where there's been an insertion or deletion. So there's really a lot of helpful functionality that you can get through using this paired end visualization. But if you do want to turn off the paired end visualization, all you need to do is just right click here, uncheck the show as paired, and then you can come down here and remove the color by strand and arrows, and we're right back to how that data looked originally. So for more advanced users, we've also enhanced the Plugins tab. So now when you navigate to the Plugins tab, you'll see a list of available plugins. Plugins can be made uh, by anyone and can add new features that you might find useful. So you'll find the name of the plugin, a short description, and then the version and the repository that it's being held in. So to install an available plugin, simply click on the box under Installed. So in this case, I'm going to go down to this Tutorial Helper. Just click there to install it. And what this does is it's just a simple little plugin that changes uh, how these little yellow tooltips pop up for some of these things. And we actually created this to make it easier for us to come up with uh, tutorials within Igby. So this is just an example of one potential plugin. And there are many others that uh, you could potentially try or make yourself, depending on what kind of functionality you're looking for. To install these plugins, simply come back down here and uncheck it. So what we really want uh, people to be able to do is easily create their own custom plugins to use with Igby. So to add your own plugin to Igby, all you'd have to do is go to this repositories button, click on that, and then click on add, and then select your repository with your plugin, submit it, and you should see it down here uh, ready to be installed and used. So another feature for advanced users that has been very heavily requested, and we're really glad to be able to integrate into Igby, is the use of R with Igby. So with Igby 8.2, you can now run commands through R to control Igby using the scripting language already available to Igby. So we've created a test file to allow users to try out some of this new functionality, which can be found on Bitbucket. So within that file is a markdown called Igby Functions. So I've already loaded it into our studio, Igby Functions, it's a markdown. Now this markdown defines several functions necessary for running Igby through R and has a practical example of how you might use the integration of R and Igby. So I've already loaded uh, this markdown into it. And the first thing I want to do is go down here and run this portion. So in order to work, we need this bioconductor package called SRADB. So you'll have to come in here, uncomment this, and run this. 
and that'll get you the SRA DB, and we want you to do the rest of this. Okay, so moving through this, the next part defines a function for IGB in order to obtain IGB through R. So this just basically tells R, go to this location and download IGB. Since we already have IGB up and running, we're not going to worry about doing anything with that. Um, and then this is just for the test version. So the main thing we want to do here is that this function is going to create a socket which will connect IGB to R. So we want to go ahead and run this chunk. This next part uh, defines several functions that we're going to use today in order to tell IGB uh, what we want it to do. So I'll just go ahead and run all of this. You can see all those functions are included up here. So the rest of the code is going to demonstrate how you might use R with IGB. So let's say that we're analyzing our data in R and we found several regions or genes of interest. Now we need a way to systematically go to each of these regions or genes, load that data, and make an image in IGB. So to do this, we need to create that connection between uh, IGB and R. I'm just going to run this current chunk. Success. We then want to tell IGB to go to our genome of interest. So we load that up. Make that a little bit bigger. And now we want to go to our location of interest within the genome. Now we want to load our data set. And let's actually load that in there. And so finally, we'll take a picture of that and you can see that that'll pop up here. And there we have our image of Igby created through R itself. So following this functionality would allow you to carry out relatively advanced analysis using Igby and R. So one potential scenario that we had come up with might be that you've just carried out a ChIP-seq study and you want to produce an image for each instance where there is evidence of transcription factor binding. So this could be you know, tens or hundreds of locations and really manually going through uh, and, and trying to take a picture of each one could be really challenging. So by loading your data into R and then having R um, potentially threshold that data and finding what you're looking for, uh, and then writing a script to tell IGB to go to each of those locations and take an image, you can really save yourself a lot of time and really automate that process. With that, that's really the main new features that I wanted to cover today. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. David's ready to answer. Yeah, absolutely. I guess one thing I would add is that a big piece of what went into A2 is not user-facing, it's engineering changes. We made some pretty large changes to um, the infrastructure that supports the IGB application to make it easier for us moving forward as engineers to add new features as they come in, as feature requests come in, and to just make it easier for the community to contribute to the project. We've made, I guess, reduced the barrier to entry there quite a bit with this release, and we're aiming to do even more of that going forward. We try to keep our ears close to the community and, and pay attention to what's new and just keeping our application up to date. So please let us know if there are new features that you're looking for, that you're envying in other browsers or you know could keep us on the cutting edge. We really appreciate community contributions, both from a development standpoint and just from getting ideas. So absolutely feel free to reach out anytime. Just not to put anyone on the spot, but uh, Dr. Albert, do you have any questions? Yeah, hi guys. So um, that that code that you copied into that long blue at the top, all those uh, IGB snapshot. Where, where can where can those be seen? That looked very complicated, actually. So it, where can we see those in practice? Of functions that we defined in R. Is that what right, right here. When you look at the screen at the top in the console up. There. All right, all those blue things that are scrolled over. 
So what I did, though, okay, that, no, starting with the socket and all those. All right, so that's his console where he executed blocks of code from our markdown. And what he executed was just a section where we defined some, some helper functions for talking to Igby through R. Okay, but everyone else would need to do that, right? Right. So our, I guess our longer term goal is to make this a part of that library. Um, what is the name of that library at the top of the markdown, do you mind? So that if you load this library, those functions would already be available to you. You would just need to um, define the socket to talk to it. So okay. we will take this to the next step by trying to make a contribution to this um, library that I have forgotten, SRADB, or possibly a standalone library. I guess we're open as a development team to either way. I don't know if Dr. Lorraine, if you want to make a comment on that. But the idea for this development round was just to um, get the functionality in place and put a demo together. That we already have a scripting engine in Igby, and this is just a simple way that R can leverage that scripting engine. So we can package this however it's most useful. OK, I see, I see. So it's, it's, you're going to develop an API on top of that, that the end user will not actually have to Write the socket. Write these functions if that's what you're asking. The idea is this: these would absolutely be part of a a library. Okay. Once okay. loaded, those methods would be available um, to the user to the R user. They would just call to the methods. And what commands do you foresee having other than taking the snapshot? Um, navigating, loading data, taking snapshots are are pretty powerful by themselves. Um, I don't know that we've thought through a, a great deal more than just navigating, loading data, and exporting images. But we're open to ideas if you have any. For example, you, can you set up multiple tracks at the same time? Um, you can. Absolutely. That's already possible. Um, okay. The function to load data is going to create a track. What what you want is really is to when you want to visualize it, people are very peculiar about the visualization. They want it to be blue and it needs to be a thick line and it's got to be exactly whatever. Otherwise, they that will that work or is that how you see it? Uh, I mean, there's nothing stopping them from going to Igby and making that sort of change, and there's nothing stopping us to from implementing a more powerful scripting engine. If there's a demand for that, uh, I don't know how far we want to take it. So I guess we're we're open to hear from the community what what's wanted. I don't think we want to spend a whole lot of engineering effort to make everything configurable from the scripting engine if that's not a use case that's common. Right? I don't know if they want to deal with choosing colors from R. If that if that makes sense to you. Well, I'm just saying, I, I think people like, when, when you visualize, you like to have some control. So people are very peculiar about visualization. That's what I know. At least people always come to me and say, OK, can you make that blue or red? Or, and then they want to be happy. Because maybe you want to show a change. In that case, you want to all of your plots, red is up, or the other way is up-regulated, down-regulated. And you kind of want colors, I would say it's important if you want to visualize, for sure. Well, yeah, it's an extra dimension to how you can um, represent information. You know, you get, you get width, you get height, you get color, <laughs> you get shape. There's all these different attributes for, the, for, the, for what you see on the screen, and you can use all of those to convey information. So it yeah. makes sense that, you know, if you're, if you're automating some aspect of creating visualizations, that you would have access to a lot of that. So I, I think I think the scripting language already has a lot of the basics, but you're right. I think we can we can add more, and that could be really powerful. Yeah, certainly that's not a, it's not a big challenge for us to add that sort of functionality. It's just a matter of really? knowing people want it. <laughs> people just have to ask us, and also we're we're in our lab. We use R all the time. So you know, so we have a few people who I guess are sort of like our example power users. So we're hoping that through kind of interacting with them, the development team can implement the right stuff. But obviously, 
we need feedback from people in the community who are using it to tell us what they want. <laughs> so, right. so we're going to try to we're going to try to keep making really nice um, documents and documentation that give people examples of how they can use it. But we we sort of started with the SRA DB library in Bioconductor because they had already implemented something like that and it seemed like a nice place to start. Yeah. So Isvan, do you use R much? You must. Uh, I use ggplot uh, when I need to make plots pretty much. But other than that, I try to do that in Python. Yeah, I would think. <laughs> or, or, of course, when we need statistical uh, statistical methods, uh, VSeq or, or uh, uh, gene ontology-based searches, mm. but typically when we drop, then we drop into R to perform that, and we try to get out of R as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> When it comes to processing large data sets, it's not really the best framework because it tends to load up a lot of things into memory. So we like to finish with R, let's put it this way, maybe. So, so the, the socket, the, 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 the basics that, that, that David added is something that could be, we could talk, we could, we could run that from inside Python too. So mm -hmm. the, it's kind of a low level it's basically, if I, David, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically like Igby's listening to a socket on the computer, so it can take commands from anything. You know, you could type it, probably type it into your shell. Yeah, I, mean, I think what you would need is, 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 is the reason we had to do socket is because R doesn't support HTTP communication, shockingly. Um, however, absolutely, that endpoint is open to any any communication with a socket. And we also have an endpoint that takes uh, the bookmark URLs, um, which you may have some familiarity with. But if not, that also can be passed to script commands. So what, we, what is it that you're passing through the socket? Is it like a binary, or do you pass like a text JSON commands? Or, or what, what format? Not, what are you passing? It, honestly, it's just text that's being parsed into, it's just the Igby scripting language, which has been around for a while. So it's fairly simple syntax. So it's very easy to write a little implementation in any language that can make a socket connection. Okay. It's very- I think that's a great idea to try to make it through uh, uh, Python as well. Python would be much easier to talk through a socket and set the whole thing up. I think it would be really easy to set it up. Yeah, so there's nothing stopping anyone from doing that. We, we haven't provided a reference implementation of wrapper methods that make that slightly less painful, but it's not painful now if you know what you're doing. Do you, if, if somebody wanted to know what the language looks like that the socket wants, where would they look? Uh, we already have documentation on the AB scripting. Okay. Go to the developer's guide or perhaps the user's guide. I think it's in the advanced feature section of the user's guide, or confusing. Let me see if I can find it for you. Um, and also, uh, yeah, so it's documented there. But I think, as we mentioned earlier, we have a lot of room for improvement as far as adding flexibility to the scripting engine. So, did, Nolan, did you find it? Okay, good. Okay, advanced features. Yeah, I found that too. Advanced features. Um, he's asking if we can load GTF files, and the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, are you mean GTF files output from Cufflinks? It can definitely read uh, Cufflinks GTF files. There, are, but unfortunately, GTF, as in all like all the GF, GFF style formats, is implemented a little differently for every application. So sometimes, oh, the GTF from Ensemble. Ugh, that's a good question. I don't know. We should. I, I guess we need to find out. Nolan, you are you brave? You want to give that a try? <laughs> See if you can get it to open in Icky. Mohammed and Isfahan both sent us a link to an FTP file. It's called Homo sapiens.grch387.gtf, and I've I've got it on my computer. It's this is is this the um, oh it's gzip. No problem. We can handle that. But it would be better if it were Tabix indexed, but it might be. If this is the latest annotations of the human genome, they're already in Igby, 
but they're coming originally from UC of Santa Cruz, so there might be some differences. And then I think the other question was from Mohammed. He wanted to know if he could make a reference genome using FASTA-file and gene models. And that is absolutely, you could definitely do that. Um, there's an option under File Custom Genome. There's, there's an option under the File menu that lets you do that. And so this is, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then you would you definitely want to give it a reference sequence because otherwise, so you would just click on the little button with the three dots on it, and then you would just choose a, a FASTA file or a two-bit file. So these are two formats that you can use for representing sequence data. Well, there's probably more, but those are the ones that we support. And you would select that, and then when you once you clicked OK, then Igby would switch over to that new genome, and you would see, you, would, you wouldn't see anything at this point except the sequence data and a number line. And you would load your gene models as a next step. Yeah, yeah. So if you wanted to see your gene models, you'd have to open it up separately. So you'd just go to the file menu again and choose open, and then open the file. And also, if you wanted to share it with people, you could set up a quick load site, and then we have documentation for that. Yeah, let's try that file. I'm really curious to see if it will open. So by default, what's happening now is um, what just happened really fast. You didn't even get to see it. But it just loaded up all the ref gene, gene models. And this is coming from UC Santa Cruz originally. So, so you just click dragged the file into the IGBY stage. Now it's, we've got some new tracks there. And now in order to actually see if the data will be parsed, he has to click load data. Um, it looks like it. This is what, see if it works. <laughs> oh, and it says go. Yeah. I think it already did some data. Pro oh, okay. So there are all of our chromosomes. <laughs> and this is the latest version uh, that was released, I think, in December. And it's, of course, they call it HG. Oh, that's a good sign. Let's zoom in and see if they look right. <laughs> see if they look okay. Oh, that's looking good. Wow. That's interesting. It looks like Ensemble has a couple of gene models that maybe Igby doesn't. Let's let's zoom in a little more. Maybe let's I just Oh, um if you'd like to see labels, you can click uh, the track to select it and then choose a label. Choose which label you'd like to see. Um, I guess ID ID is probably fine. And then I think if you want the labels to show, you're going to have to stretch the stage vertically because there's just not enough space. So yeah, we're, we're probably going to fix that because that's kind of annoying. Um, and there it is. Oh, it looks like it worked OK. So yes, I think, um, Mohammed, I think you, if you would like to look at GTF files from Ensemble, it will definitely work. Um, and then you can change the, you can, yeah. So there's a lot of sort of things you can do to change how it looks. <laughs> Um, well, that's neat. So are there any differences between Ensemble and UCSC? It looks like there's a few. I mean, I'm seeing a gene model in the Ensemble data set that's not in the UCSC data set. I wonder why that is. I, I always just assume they would be the same. Any other questions? Oh, Shishma had a question. She wants to know, oh, documentation about how to learn about the SRADB package. SRADB is part of Bioconductor, and, and it's really pretty terrific. I mean, if you're interested in working with short read archive data, it has a really nice way to access all the data sets. So you can search it, and I, mean, I haven't really used it a lot, but it's got amazing functions. Um, so what you would want to do is go to um, Bioconductor um, website. Oh, I think I misspelled it. Um, yeah, bioconductor.org, thank you. And I would just use that search box to start with, SRADB. So I guess it stands for Short Read Archive Database. So, oh, top hit. OK. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah, and then they tell you how to install it, give you some information about who's, who's maintaining it. And, and then there's a, like most of the libraries in Bioconductor, there's a vignette. They call it a vignette. It's like a tutorial, and it's one of those PDF links. Well, you can't see where I'm pointing, but 
Yeah, if you, and if you click on the PDF link, it'll download a PDF that gives that kind of walks you through the functionality. Um, and my experience is that if I get stuck, if I'm if I'm trying to use a library and I don't really understand something, I can just post to one of the lists and I'll get an answer almost immediately. So BioConductor is using BioStars, kind of their own instance of BioStars, for their documentation, for their help, um, help lists. So if you ever get into trouble, you just post on there and someone will answer you almost immediately. It's pretty great. So Isman, while you're here, What's your favorite IDE for Python? Uh, well, one is, is one and only, the real deal. OK, now I'm going to tell you something. PyCharm. What I really like is PyCharm. And it has a full Pycharm. version, PyCharm. PyCharm. OK. Yeah? And it's version. great. It's really great. Excellent. I've been looking for an IDE for Python that I like as much as R Studio for mm -hmm. R. So I use R Studio all the time and I love it. So I'd love to find something as awesome <laughs> for Python. So I'm going to try that. Yeah, you have three nice features in, in that that um, allow you to jump to various parts of the code where a certain function is defined. That's really, I, I use only a small functionality of it, but what I use, I really have grown to like it quite a bit. It's a nice one. typed language, but that's even easier. <laughs> what? It's a typed language. It, it's basically that IDE is providing some of the uh, functionality using heuristics that are just available by default and like a Java IDE because of the static typing. But, it, but he's right. It, does, it makes your life a lot easier if you're doing refactoring or tracing and trying to debug. Yeah. And, and what it does, it proofreads code, so it, it highlights what what a variable, for example, it's undefined. It will tell you, right, before having to run it, it tells, look, this is not defined, and it underlines. It's a little bit like with Word, when you write something and it's misspelled, it's exactly the same effect. So. A whole series of bugs don't happen anymore because it sort of proofreads constantly. Wow. Uh, everything. I really like it. Is that and it has you, a free version as well. Is that what you use when you're developing BioStars or one of these big? Yes, nowadays that's what I use all, for everything pretty much. HTML is really nice. It has very nice HTML and JavaScript intelligence to it. So it recognizes whatever code you have and, and follows it through and formats it and highlights it. and. It's really nice. It also has a, a Java. So the, the same company, JetBrains, produces a very famous Java IDE as well. And so I think it's called um, Intelli, IntelliJ IDE. That's the same company, basically, that does that. I think we'll, I'm definitely going to check it out, because I've just been using Emacs and Terminal. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of lame. <laughs> well, I mean, I, there's got to be something better. So just a quick question for anybody that's still on the line. What organisms are you working with? We're trying to decide which species we should support the most actively. Are there other model organisms that aren't getting good enough support? So if you have suggestions, please let us know. So if you have data sets that you know about in the public domain that you would like to be easy to visualize in our system, let us know and we can add them. You know, we want to make sure that the really important reference data sets that you would be comparing your data to are available. Because otherwise, I think most people would have to download them from the short read. If you're, for example, if it's an RNA-seq data set, you'd have to download them from the short read archive and align them and go through all of this work. And we could probably do that for you pretty easily and set it up so that everybody can see it. If you have any recommendations or tutorials you'd like to see, uh, email me and let me know. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Thanks.